What is up, everyone? We are back again, doing it all over again. And this time, this afternoon, this four o'clock hour, half hour, we're going to talk to an amazing, amazing um, director, producer, writer, um, just genuine good guy in the world. Um, making sure everything is muted so we don't get any feedback there. Excellent. All right. So we have with us writer, director, producer of the amazing Dear White People. I don't know if where you were when Dear White People first came out <laughs> in theaters and, and on Netflix, but I know um, I remember reading in the trade papers about this dynamic thing that happened at Sundance. And people were just talking and um, all sorts of fantastic sort of, you know, who, who has the nerve to have a movie called and did y'all hear about and have y'all seen? And it was just so wonderful and buzzworthy and, um, and for all the right reasons. Uh, it's the, I keep calling the film and the subsequent um, TV series, um, the voice of a generation. And the reason I call it that is because, you know, with the social media platforms that we have and, and the technology that students have at their fingertips, um, folks are, are fearless in communicating who they are and what they do in the world. And it's one of the things that I love about um, Dear White People and about the, the creator that we're going to talk to today, Mr. Justin Simeon. Thank you so much for joining us today, man. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to, to be talking to you guys. Oh, shoot. Now, I thank you, especially I just want to get real humble about this because I, I very briefly had a chance to talk to you at Sundance this past year right. and um, just kind of hijacked you for about 30 seconds and said, <laughs> Here, here's my number. Take my number. I'm walking away. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what you have been since then is just gracious with your time. And I really appreciate you um, sharing, you know, splitting some of your time from your writer's room to share with us this afternoon. Yeah, uh, why don't you? Yeah, yeah. Go, tell us tell us who you are, and what you do in the world. So uh, I'm Justin Simeon. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, you know, I was born and raised in Houston, Texas. Uh, and uh, somehow I became a filmmaker. <laughs> and uh, I make movies and TV shows. I made, um, as you said, I, I began my career with Dear White People, uh, debuting at Sundance in 2014. Uh, turned that into a series uh, for Netflix, uh, which, you know, right now we are, we're all, all the writers are on Zoom right in the fourth season, fourth and final season. Uh, and uh, I just debuted my second movie, Bad Hair, at Sundance this past year, which we sold to uh, Hulu for distribution at some point this year. Uh, wow. Whenever we figure out what distribution looks like in America. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations on that. Thank you. That movie was so much fun. I, I saw it you. at Sundance. I saw it in the second week and the place was packed. And pe it was a roller coaster ride. People yeah. <laughs> were in their jackets and, you know, and dipping and doing. And um, I, one of my former students who was the second speaker of the series, Tiffany Black. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Tiffany, yeah. I taught Tiffany years ago. And then I, she was our second speaker on the series. And um, I texted her. I had to stop. I was like, where's my phone? That, that, Tiffany's in this movie. <laughs> it was, She's great. It, uh, it was thrilling. Um, did you did you had you an interest in making a horror movie or what felt like a, a dark comedy or horror comedy movie? I mean, oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. So I you know, when I was growing up, um, you know, we didn't have I didn't know what a film director was. There weren't like writers or artists in my family at, at all. <laughs> and so what I had was I had an Aunt Zora and I named a major character after her in Bad Hair uh, who was. She would watch me when my mom couldn't. I was raised by my mom who was uh, out here in the world in these streets trying to take care of me on her own. And when my aunt would watch, watch movies and it would just be whatever she wanted to watch. It didn't matter how young I was. And so, you know, those are the first movies I remember watching and uh, venture out into the genre space of like the slasher movies, like where you just go and you see a bunch of people getting murdered or whatever. Psychological thrillers out there that are just among my favorite movies ever. And I had the script about a girl who gets a weave in 1989 Los Angeles 
and um, there's a killer weave, <laughs> which is a bit of a, a play on words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, it's certainly, it, 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 man. It does very well for her career, but it also has some hidden costs. And um, I've been working on this thing. And when Get Out came out, I was able to convince my producers, like, this is, we're on the verge of a new genre here. Yeah. And, you know, these movies always speak to what people are really afraid of. And as a person of color, as a queer person of color, um, I got some things that I don't think have really been addressed in a movie yet that, right. that scares the crap out of me. <laughs> and I want to get into that, but with a very black aesthetic and sort of join, you know, these two things that people think of as going together, which is like the kind of out there psycho thrillers of the 80s and the 70s and like black people and, and, and black women and black concerns. Yeah, my colleague uh, Tony Clomax is on with us as well. He was sitting next to me during the um, during the screening of that. Tony, open open your mic. Tony said that exact same thing when we finished watching the film. We walked away and we went to get something to eat. And he looked at me. and He was like, "We're on the brink of something because with Get Out and us and you know Jordan taking um, Twilight Zone and." Um, and uh, the upcoming Candyman and and mm -hmm. uh, con what is the movie that's coming out? Confederate, is that, wait. Uh, Antebellum. Antebellum. Antebellum, that's yeah. it. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, we were, we actually sat and had ribs over the, well, I had ribs, I don't know. And I had no ribs. No. He had no ribs. <laughs> we sat and had an extensive conversation about <laughs> where movies, where black storytelling is heading in terms of the dynamic um, options in terms of horror or, um, you know, just things off the deep beaten path. Tony, why right. don't you chime in and talk about what you what you experienced after watching that movie? Well, yeah, I mean, basically, I, I feel like when it comes to, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So when it comes to science fiction, horror, black folks are just forgotten. Mm -hmm. And so when you know, that's what we were talking about. And so when we, you know, with Jordan and Justin, and all these different stories. I mean, this is this is the time now to act and, and get these stories out. So um, black folks, we love these genres. And, and and I think now Hollywood is like, oh, oh, black folks can't tell uh, sci-fi stories and, and horror stories. So let's listen to it. So so that's that's that was my take on it. I'm like the time is now to act now on these genres. Yeah. yeah. Uh Justin, how are you faring during the pandemic? How is the pandemic of, uh, impacting you? You've told us a little bit that it's impacting your work a little bit because you all are doing your writer's room in the in, in a Zoom, much like this. Um, how are you faring as, as an individual? I'm, I'm fair and fine, you know, especially, you know, I try reading the news like at 10 minutes at a time because all I can really take is horrifying. And um, all things considered, I got to say I'm very blessed and my family is good and you know, um, I'm, I'm glad that I can still do what I do from home. You know, not everybody has that luxury right now. And, um, and you know, we're just, we're making it work. You know, it's, it's kind of weird working with a writer's room on Zoom all day, but we're figuring it out. And, uh, you know, it, we were looking, you know, it, originally we were supposed to start shooting the four season of Dear White People next week. That's obviously not gonna happen. Right. Um, so, you know, it's kind of, it's a weird, I don't want to, it's a weird blessing in disguise for me because uh, I always wanted to just write and then just shoot. Usually on a TV show, uh, you know, you're still writing during the production period. And uh, so, you know, for all of its, all of the things that, you know, we've lost and the economic hit and all that and the uncertainty, uh, it's, it's nice at least to just be able to do one part of the process at a time. It's yeah. obviously, it's the last season of Dear White People. Uh, we want to get it right and, um, you know, I want to go out with a bang. So it's nice to have at least some time and some resource to figure out what exactly we want to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Before I turn it over to you to give your, your guest lecture, your, your wisdom droplets and, and <laughs> shower us with that, I want to give a chance uh, to some of my colleagues, other colleagues to um, ask you any questions um, before we turn it over. So I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Jennifer Erdley, uh, Rachel Morgan, Robert Campbell, Keith Morris, if you guys have any questions or turn on your mics, 
from a you know from where you stand from the things that you do around production um ask you know contribute and, and talk to justin before we we move on sure well this is rachel morgan i'm um, with lawson state community college i'm also um the creative director for the sidewalk film festival and sidewalk cinema here in uh, birmingham alabama um, and you know i think one thing my students struggle with and that i know can be really difficult is that you know, we'll do just about anything to, to, to not write, you know, it's like, I'd rather unload the dishwasher than write, you know, and so I just wonder how you, how you get around that, or if that's also an issue for you. I know a lot of writers describe that same experience, but what do you do to sort of force yourself to actually sit down and write? Man, that is a great question. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't hurt to have a deadline. Um, so I certainly, I, you know, before anyone would pay me to write, I always tried to impose some kind of external deadline. You know, back when I was doing Dear White People and nobody was looking for that script, like not anybody, uh, the impetus to keep doing it other than sort of like one day in the future I'll get to make it would sometimes be like, hey, I'm gonna get all of my actor friends together for a table read in three weeks. Completely arbitrary deadline just so that I would have, um, you know, a deadline to work towards and to have something that made me feel like I completed something. Uh, I also uh, formed a, a few like writers groups on the weekends with friends from work, uh, other people who weren't necessarily in their, the job of their dreams, but were trying to write something. Uh, again, to just get that sense of accountability. Mm -hmm. um, what I found is that, you know, it's not so much the writing that I'm freaked out about that key, that makes me not want to do it. It's that feeling when you're just staring at the blank page and you're in the question and you don't know how the hell to get to the other side. You know what kind of scene you want, you kind of know where you want to go, but you don't really know the specifics of how to get there. And I think that as writers and particularly as artists that are trying to say things from the margins and say things that are not necessarily in the mainstream yet, I think for me, the benefit of you know, having to write on deadlines, it forces me into getting more and more comfortable in that place of not knowing. Because believe it or not, that's where the brilliant stuff comes from. You know, it's when you just are, when you can bear to just look at that blank computer screen for a few hours until something comes. Just like learn to have the patience with yourself to write bad, you know, the first time through, or to just like get the scene out of your system, bad dialogue and everything, just get it. The more you can get comfortable not being great yet, <laughs> the better you'll be because nobody's great first, you know, nobody's first drafts are popping like that. Like it's really the people who are consistent and um, keep it up and form a habit that sort of get stuff made. And, you know, with Dear White People, I, I was in a full-time job that was not paying me nothing, but, uh, you know, really didn't leave me much free time either. I was a publicity assistant. And, uh, you know, I sort of just made a decision one day by hook or by crook, I was gonna be a filmmaker. And if it took me 40 years, I, I was gonna be happier on that 41st year than I would be if I didn't try. And I just, I made myself sit down <laughs> every weekend, I stopped going out. I just took the little time I had and I forced myself to confront that blank page as often as I could. And, uh, and the deadlines helped. Wow, Tiffany said that same thing on uh, Tuesday of last week. She said, you know, giving herself sometimes arbitrary deadlines forced yeah. her to have certain achievements completed um, a lot faster than she would if she just said, you know what, I'm going to do a thing. And then when it when comes time to do it, I'll figure it out. No, she's like, yep. I'm going to do a thing. It will be done in two days, 48 yep. hours. It should be done. So this is reinforcing that message, young people. Uh, mm -hmm. You have a vision for something. You have a thought for something. You know, be courageous and set that deadline and 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 go ahead and bang it out. I'm taking that advice as well. Uh, Jen, uh, Robert, Keith, you got anything you want to add before I turn it over to Justin? Yes. Um, I was wondering, you know, what is something that you wish that you would have learned or some, some wisdom that you would pass on that you, you know, didn't learn in college, but entering the industry that mm. maybe struck you that would be helpful for our students? 
You know, I always pre, I always go to this particular well, but I'm gonna go to it because it's really important to me. But like mental health is like a thing that really should be emphasized for artists, particularly artists of color. Because here's the thing, like we're working out our stuff in the work and people are responding to it uh, and having emotional reactions to it that sometimes we don't know what to do with. And it may not be about us or it may be about the work and all this kind of stuff. And just learning to separate all of that. Uh, is really super important and you know not putting every you know I remember I just I just remember thinking out of college like as soon as I make a movie as soon as I get on as soon as I make my break I'll be happy uh, you know I'll, 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 I'll sort of be fulfilled and boy was that not true <laughs> and I love what I do I love what I do but I if I didn't you know if I didn't take care of my mental health in some way I, I would not be able to continue to um to love what I'm doing, you know, to really, uh, like, I, I, I love it, but sometimes it's hard to love. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. the truth is, is that working in the industry means that you're constantly facing criticism, whether mm -hmm. it's helpful criticism or not helpful criticism from actual critics, from executives, from your friends, from yourself. The critics, the critic in your head is usually the worst one. Mm -hmm. And we have to learn how to navigate that stuff and stay healthy. You know what I'm saying? Because like, I think especially a lot of our heroes, like the, the black folks that I look up to, they're always tragic figures, you know, that had to like die in the name of their art. And we're at a generation now where like, we don't have to do it that way anymore. Like, I'm not saying it's great out there in these streets for people of color and our stories, but it's better than it's ever been. And we have to we have to really take care of it and think of the quality of our lives. And that sounds very Pollyanna-ish, but I'm telling you, like that's the juice that you need to keep working. It's very important. You will run out of steam. Yeah. Thank you for that message. <laughs> Thank that you. was uh, that was Dr. Jennifer Erdley, who um, is one of our esteemed faculty members here at Prairie View. Um, she focuses in nonfiction and documentary filmmaking and performance studies. Um, Cool. So tell you what, I'm going to kill all of our mics and I'm going to turn it over to you. You got about 10, 15 minutes to inspire us as you always do. But oh my God, us, no pressure. Teach, teach, us, teach us a thing. Yeah, go for it, brother. Well, look, I'm going to keep it. We'll see if I get to 10, 15. I might go over, I might go under because I do want to give everybody a chance to like talk about specifically what your questions are. Um, but one of the things I like to talk about and one of the mantras mottos of my life is to turn the bugs into features. Now that comes out of computer coding. <laughs> and what it means is that like the, the things that seem like mistakes or seem like deficiencies or seem like things that, you know, aren't what, everything that you needed, that actually is the thing that can make your work distinctive and make it impactful uh, and make it important. Uh, you see it all the time with filmmakers where their early films are fantastic and, and full of life. And then they, they go back and they finally get to make the movie with all of the resources at their disposal and it's trash. <laughs> it's because the, the obstacles really are in our way to make the work better. And I'm just gonna tell you just a brief little, just hit my personal history and how that kind of motto has always informed me. Um, but I, you know, I grew up in Houston, Texas uh, like I was saying at the start of this call, nobody in my family knew what filmmaking was or what artists were. Or, like there was no vocabulary for what I wanted to do. And I remember watching, I remember watching TV and thinking like, I think, like I had a hunch that it was somebody's job to pick and choose what to show and when to show it in a TV show. I had no idea what that was. Um, I would read the credits and I'd guess that maybe that was a director or a producer, but I knew that that's what I wanted to do. But I'm, th I, the reason I'm putting it that way is so you know how far from the goal I was. <laughs> uh, we didn't have money for cameras. Um, I didn't have money for like special academy. I didn't have any of the resources. You know, you hear about like Steven Spielberg making little short films with a Super 8 camera and all that stuff. I didn't have any of that stuff. And not only did I not have that stuff, but nobody in my family knew what the hell I was even talking about. Like no one could relate to what I wanted to do. Um, but everything that made me feel like I didn't have enough or I didn't know enough or I wasn't in the right place ended up being the thing that made my career distinctive, like literally down the line. Uh, so, you know, when I was in high school, uh, I went to HSPVA in Houston, performing a visual arts high school. I was a very shy kid and I was extremely naive. And I thought theater and film were close enough. 
And despite having never been in, in nobody's play and not really being known to just start talking in a room full of people or full of strangers, I decided I was gonna audition for this, this you know, for the theater program. I didn't know I couldn't because I never did it before and I didn't know how bad I was. And, um, and to me, they were close, you know, they were close. And thank God I was that naive because that school uh, opened me up to theater and to telling a story uh, on the stage and to working with actors, which I think um, has given me like a wealth of knowledge that literally most film directors don't seem to have. Like a lot of film directors are very visual people, but sometimes struggle with working with actors. And because I couldn't afford to be a visual filmmaker uh, when I was a kid, you know, I got this other training that ended up being so helpful. And, and it, it, it just gives me a different kind of way to work. I'm not saying it's the best way or it's the right way, but it's my way because that's what I learned. And I, I came up in um, a theater program where the first thing we did, and I, and I highly recommend this to everybody uh, to do with movies that you love or movies or, or TV shows that are like the ones you wanna create. We watched Raisin in the Sun and as a class and we watched it and paused it every time a scene changed or every time an actor did something interesting. And we asked ourselves as a class, why did the filmmakers do this? And it made, it made us break it down like everything was a choice. Even when something, even when it felt like a weird cut or it felt like, oh, that shot's really blown out or it was something that normally at that age, I was, I was just like, ah, I don't like that movie, it's boring or I would reject what I was seeing. I learned at a very young age to watch everything like it's a choice because you want to be as in control of as many choices as possible. And a bunch of them you're making and you don't even realize it, but the game is to be aware of how many choices are really yours to make. And that really changed my perspective as an artist. It really shaped my perspective as an artist. And, um, and furthermore, like it, I, I began to see over and over again how this turning your bugs into features really is kind of like the distinctive style of, of my work. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example of that. So, uh, you know, after, you know, after theater school, uh, I got into film school. I got into the only film school that gave me a little bit of money so I could leave uh, and, 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 and go get an education without, you know, I don't know how else I would have got one, but they gave me some money. I went to Chapman University. And um, again, you know, I, I couldn't do what the other kids did. I couldn't work on film sets for free because uh, I actually needed to earn money. I really, I had to work part-time. I had to earn, you know, money. I couldn't intern on a bunch of film sets. Um, I didn't have my own equipment. I couldn't sort of, you know, go out and just sort of make these extravagant, extravagant short films uh, like some of my classmates could. But because of that, uh, instead of trying to do something I couldn't do with resources I didn't have, I, I thought about what I, I did have at my disposal. And the cheapest but most profound thing that a film can have is, 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 is an idea uh, and, and, and be about something. And so in college, because I couldn't go, I mean, I, mean, I went to the school with these wonderful white children who could afford helicopters and do all kind of crazy stuff and action sequences and and go on set and just you know really make these amazing things i didn't have all that so it had to be the thing was only going to be as good as my idea and as good as my script and as good as my dialogue so those are the things that i got good at uh is you know i i poured myself into reading every book i could on how to write a screenplay um i watched everything i could uh, and, you know, I tried to always come from the place that I knew. And one of the things I experienced at my school at Chapman University was I was, you know, I was one of very few black kids there. And our black experience, when we would sit together and we'd talk in the BSU about what being black was like, it always had to do with being a black face in a white place. And I thought, wow, why isn't that a movie? Like, why isn't that a show? It's like all me and my friends are ever talking about. Um, but, you know, around mid 2000s at that time, you know, every version of a black movie was black people surrounded by all black people. And I thought, okay, so this thing that's making me feel, again, deficient could actually be the thing I could make, I could tell my story about. I could tell a story about being on a college campus. Um, and in my mind at that time, I'm like, I don't know if this is going to be a short, I don't know, I don't know how to make a movie yet. I don't know how to raise money. So let me come up with something I can do on my own in my own backyard. 
And, but, I, but I knew that the thing that would sell it is that I could say something that nobody else was saying because nobody else was talking about that experience of being you know, one of very few or being the only one. And so in 2005, I started writing uh, what would eventually become Dear White People. Now, again, I couldn't afford to just get out here in these streets and just write for a living, okay? I had to get a job. So I got a job, uh, I got the, the only job I could get, which was really a, a desk job at Focus Features working in the publicity department while all my other friends who wanted to be directors were working on film sets and assisting directors and doing all kinds of stuff that didn't really pay them. But you know, in my mind was gonna get them to where we were all trying to go a lot faster than me. And I was stuck on this publicity desk. Uh, but I kept working on Dear White People. Uh, I formed a writer's group with my friends and we worked on it on the weekends. Uh, everybody had like, you know, we, had, we gave each other deadlines like, okay, we're gonna have, you know, five more pages written by the next time we meet and we're gonna read them out loud. And uh, I would put together table reads. Table reads really are like one of the best things you can do as a writer to make you feel like you're doing something. Cause so many steps along the way don't really feel like you've accomplished anything. And so I would get friends of mine and actors of mine or just people and we'd get together and we would read our scripts and we'd give each other notes. Why? Because so we needed someone to check for our work. <laughs> the industry wasn't, so we checked for it ourselves. Uh, and I kept doing that. Um, and what I realized, uh, I, I actually spent eight years working in publicity, wishing I was a film director and thinking I was you know, wasting my time. Uh, but what, what ended up happening is around 2011, 2012, uh, I had like yet another workshop of Dear White People. And after, after that table read, the conversation that people were having in the audience, or in the audience was just the people who showed up to read it and give me thoughts and stuff, was the conversation I knew I wanted people to have in the lobby after the movie. So I felt like I finally had a script that was worth shooting. And now that took me from 2005 to like 2011, working independently on my own, on other things. I, had a, I was trying out a web studio, doing all kinds of stuff, but like that's how long it took to get that script to a place where I thought it was worth shooting. And I quickly realized that even though the script might be worth shooting, nobody was looking to make a multi-protagonist, sprawling, comedic take on black life. Like nobody was checking for that. Like, where's the guy in the fat suit? Like, where are the jokes? Like, it was not the kind of black movie Hollywood was looking for. But that eight years that I spent in publicity, while all my friends were doing other things, actually taught me a lot. Because I worked on movies like Brokeback Mountain. I worked on movies like uh, Paranormal Activity, uh, which if you guys remember that, that was like a tiny, very small budget horror film. And uh, they, I remember being part of the team and I was like, how do we release this movie? And I remember I was sitting under a tree and we came up with the demand it campaign, make people feel like they're demanding it to come to their, their theater. We came up with this whole campaign and we turned a hundred thousand dollar movie into this multi-million dollar behemoth uh, for the studio. And I realized like as important as the story you're telling is and as important as the, the quality and the time and the money and the research you have to put into your films and your projects, almost more important at first is the story about the story. And I knew that like when the Dear White People script was ready, I didn't have any idea how to make that movie. I did not have nobody's money. I was in debt. I was uh, very, very broke. Um, but I knew that I could make a trailer. I knew that I could inform, I, could, I knew I could tell people the story about my story. And it wasn't just a story about black kids trying to get along in a school uh, you know, where they weren't being reflected. It was also, it was also about my generation getting to see different kinds of stories about ourselves. It was about like, you know, where is my school days? Where is my Robert Townsend? Where, where is my generation Spike Lee? Where are these conversational movies that don't have to be broad appeal, you know, blockbusters, but can just be about a conversation that we're having amongst ourselves so that we can feel seen in our own cinema. That's the story about the story. And, you know, when I made that trailer, uh, for Dear White People, which, you know, I can send around a link as you can still find it in a few places. Uh, the Culture Machine uh, YouTube page, which is my production company, has it up. Um, but I made this trailer, uh, again, for no money. We stole locations. We were being chased off of locations left and right. Uh, there are scenes that are cut between two characters that were shot in completely different time periods and, and areas. But I knew that if I could just get the little parts that would fit in this little two-minute trailer to look great, and to look like a real movie 
and to get people to think that something really was about to come out only to hit them with, yeah, no, I don't have any money, but could you give me some? I knew that I could prove there was an audience for it. Even if I didn't raise the full money to make the movie, I knew I could at least prove to people that I wasn't the only one checking for a movie like this. And that's exactly what happened. And so this PR experience that I was bemoaning and felt so, you know, behind all of my colleagues because I was stuck behind a PR desk, I turned that bug into really the biggest feature of my career, literally. It was, it was the first one I ever made. And um, the, very, the same financier that turned us down passed on us the first time, came back around and financed the movie when they saw how big that trailer was. Uh, and they saw that we were able to generate an audience without there even being a movie. Uh, now, when it came time to actually make the movie, that was crazy, y'all, because we had no money, no time. We, I shot that feature film in 19 days with two weeks of prep in a different city which just in case you're wondering is, is crazy, okay? <laughs> um, we, we flew into Minneapolis because we heard they had a tax, a tax credit. We, we landed, looked at a school and we were told, look, uh, if you wanna shoot here, you're gonna need to shoot here in two weeks. Otherwise, you're not gonna be able to get the tax credit and you're not gonna be able to get the campus. And so it was either like make this movie in two weeks or don't make the movie. So I sat up in Minneapolis, allergic as hell, to all the ragweed in the air, I was a hot Benadryl mess, okay? And in two weeks, we figured out how to cast and shoot that damn movie. <laughs> and because we, it was so fast and it was so on the fly, I realized like, okay, you know, I can't make necessarily the script that I wrote. Uh, the script that I wrote is a very in-depth, uh, detailed look at all of these different characters. I, I'm not gonna have the resources to do that. I'm gonna have to do sketches of characters. You know, we're gonna get to know Sam, we're gonna get to know Lionel, we're gonna kind of get to know Coco, we're gonna kind of get to know Troy, but I'm gonna, instead of doing um, the other comp in my head, which was Nashville, which is a great Robert Altman movie, instead of being able to do that multi-protagonist movie, I kind of need to look more at something like Do the Right Thing, where in Do the Right Thing, it's also a movie about a lot of people, but Spike is telling one person's story at a time. You know, he follows Mookie, and then he follows Buggin' Out, and then he follows, you know, the mayor, and then he fought one character at a time. I was like, okay, so that's how I can turn that bug into a feature. I can do that on, I can take the thing that feels like a deficiency and make it a choice. And, and I think that that one got me a movie fit completed, which was the only goal at the time. And, uh, you know, I was able to get that project done. Wasn't everything I wanted it to be, but it was good enough to get into Sundance and it was good enough to get me a deal to make a show where I could go into more detail about all of these characters' lives. Uh, you know, I made that movie in a, in a, in, you know, in a, in a world that was before Black Lives Matter, where Black activism wasn't really like out there in the zeitgeist. It was still something we were like huddling about and talking about. And when that movie hit, Black Lives Matter started happening. And, and people started to hit me in Q and A's like, why aren't, you, why aren't you dealing with activism? And why aren't you dealing with this? And why aren't you dealing with that? It was a bug. Turn it into a feature though. Because for the show, I was able to sort of go like, yeah, I mean, I made that this movie at a particular time and place, but this is the time and place right now. Let's take all of these issues that people had with the movie, whether it's the title feels racist to some white people, it's not, but it felt racist to some white people. Uh, some people felt like, you know, there wasn't enough black activism in it. Some people felt like, what am I saying about Sam, the girl ended up with the white guy. You know, people had all these, these statements yeah. about the movie. And I, I tend to make things that, provoke a lot of conversation. Um, but every season of that show is, is, the reason why the seasons work is because the seasons are taking the feedback, the commentary, the criticism, the praise, and making that the basis of the next, of the next show. So, you know, um, Sam's issue with her white boyfriend became the hot topic of the first season. Is, is her radio show, Dear White People, Racist to White People? No, became a topic of the first season. Uh, all of these things that, that felt like critiques of the film or the film experience actually became the basis upon which I made the first season. When white people went crazy, uh, not all white people, but some white people went crazy over the title when we hit Netflix, uh, and there was this, that was the, right before Trump and right before uh, all the bots took over Twitter. And, and we had all these bots like inundating our YouTube page with like down votes and, and, and like trying to crush us, trying to get us canceled, made that the topic of the second season. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, for me, 
the places that feel a little scary or a little edgy or make me feel defeated have always been the place that I get my best ideas from. Uh, when we made Bad Hair, which is my second film, we had a little bit more money than Dear White People, but not nearly enough and certainly not enough time. And uh, in order to get that movie done, I had to start shooting it while I was still writing the third season of Dear White People, uh, which was really, really tough uh, to, to handle both of those things at the same time. And we had special effects that wouldn't work and things that we tried and it didn't do. And it, it, I kept saying it, let's turn the bugs into features. You know, like, oh, we can't like do this crazy sequence. Great, well, let's pare it down and let's do it with practical effects and let's get real hair on the set. And let's, you know, we, we were always sort of pivoting in order to meet these problems. And, and I think what can happen sometimes for filmmakers, particularly filmmakers of color, because we feel like we have to be perfect out the gate or they'll never give us a chance again, is, you know, sometimes our own criticism of ourselves, we can feel so defeated that it's not what we imagined, that we never get the thing done. And, you know, I'm telling you, like the best movies ever made, ever made, the filmmakers who made them had no idea they did it, okay? Everybody, you know, Star Wars is the perfect example, okay? Star Wars came out and completely changed the entire cinema. It, it, there were no blockbusters, there were no sequels and Marvel movies and universe movies. And all. None of that existed before Star Wars. But when George Lucas made that movie, nobody thought that movie was anything. They couldn't, they couldn't get that movie into theaters. The reason it was such a blockbuster is because it's only playing in like 14 theaters. And so everybody went to the same theater and, and rounded the block waiting in line for it. Nobody knew what this movie was about to be. And even George Lucas himself continues to make changes and add stormtroopers and dinosaurs and da 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 add all the stuff he felt like was missing. But none of, nobody needed that stuff. It was, it was the, the, the movie is so inventive because he couldn't just shoot what he had in his head. He had to shoot around it and he had to give you these ideas about things that he couldn't show you. When you finally get to the episode one of Star Wars and you finally see all the stuff he wanted you to see, we were all bored, you know? And so it's like, the, the universe keeps telling me, giving me this lesson over and over again. It's like, literally look, look the obstacles in the face, whatever they are, financial, um, material wise, you're stuck in your house because it's a quarantine, whatever it is, look those things in the face and say, how can I turn this bug into a feature? How can I make this thing that makes me feel like I'm at a deficit be the thing that people are talking about, uh, how exciting this is? Um, I guarantee you that that is a strategy for success over the long term, uh, which is why that's kind of like my little capsule lesson. But I would also like to talk, you know, more specific. So if anybody has questions. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> Woo, child, my, my whole entire head is about to pop because it is, <laughs> you are dry. One of our students put into the chat on here on Zoom. He says, wow, this is Justice Eigenbar. He said, wow, this is priceless information here. There's no better <laughs> way to say it. There's no better way to say it. Um, I had like three questions and I think, in that, you 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 definitely took care of those. I'm gonna have my students go ahead and open your mics and turn on your video uh, so that Justin can see your face. And why don't you go ahead and uh, ask your questions. Do your thing, people. Yeah. Okay, I have a question. Hello. Okay, hi, my name is Amarachi Ade. Um, and my question to you is, how were you able to get your movie turned into um, a television series? Like, what were the steps that you took to get there? Okay, thank you. That was a great question. So, um, so the movie was completed, and we began to do something called tastemaker screenings, which is even though we had, we were gonna show at Sundance, we were gonna do all this stuff. We wanted to just get cool people in rooms in various places to watch the movie. One of those cool people happened to be a television executive at Netflix named Tara Duncan, and she uh, started she she left that screening feeling what I felt, which is that like the movie's cool but it also opens the door for an ongoing series. And she was like, what would that be? So, you know, there was no offer on the table, but while we were trying to put the movie out and I was finding myself in front of audiences, answering questions and talking with real, you know, 20 some year olds who were really in college still, uh, in the back of my mind, I started a little file of stories that the movie didn't get a chance to tell. And uh, by the time the movie actually came out, that little file of stories. And I, I remember I would just like go, you know, 
if, if it was like we were having a screening in some city or whatever, I would just go home and I would just like write maybe a sentence down or an idea or two. And I realized like I had all these stories that I wanted to continue telling. And um, I, I specifically read um, all the books I could find on crafting TV series. There's one called Crafty TV Writing in particular. Uh, that was really about saying that like the thing that drives a show forward are its characters more so than its plot. You really need a setup that and an interesting cast of characters so that when you just explain it to people, it kind of writes itself. That's how interesting the characters are and that's how like opposed they are. And like they just sort of, you have a group of people who are just automatically at odds in some way and automatically can't get something that they want, but you can't stop watching them talk to each other. If you can figure out a formula for that, then you have a TV show. And so that's what I started to just craft on my own. And so by the time that the movie came out, uh, and whenever you have something that comes out, uh, whenever you get to that stage, you're going to go on the water bottle tour. You're going to essentially like go on all of these meetings to secure a job. And instead of jobs, you will get water bottles. And But when I went on my water bottle tour, and I sat up at Lionsgate because they bought the um, home video rights for the movie, and they just threw it out there like, so what would you do if you did a TV show? I was like, I'm glad you asked. And I was ready. <laughs> I knew exactly what I would do with a TV show. I knew exactly how many characters I needed. I knew what I would do if it was 13 episodes, if it was 10 episodes, if it was 15 episodes. I knew what I would do if it was streamed all at once on Netflix, which was like a new thing at the time, or if it came out week to week. I sort of problem solved all of these things for fun. <laughs> <laughs> in the interim, because I knew that that question would get asked. So um, specifically, that's how I did it. And, you know, I, I remember I used to be so scared of pitch, pitch meetings. I used to think of like, oh, God, I can't sit and stand in front of a room and like pitch an idea and all that kind of stuff. But then I realized like, it's just the characters. Like if you come up with really juicy characters and talk about them with a group of people, that's all anybody who's selling a TV show is doing. Mm. <laughs> that's mm. all they're doing. Yeah. They're, they're describing a world and a group of people who are like, yeah, I'd tune in to see these people interact every week. That's really the job of a TV creator. Uh, that's something anybody can do. That's something that doesn't require a bunch of money or a bunch of access. So then when you do get into that room and you strike up that conversation, yours is the conversation they can't stop thinking about. Yeah. Uh, our next question is coming from Mariah Smith. Uh, Mariah, go ahead and ask your question. Hi. Um, my question is, if I have a series in mind, do you think it's best to do a short film first or actually do like different episodes? I think, um, well, well, follow up question, series in mind to do what for? Like, are you mostly a writer, director, both, actor? Like, what's the goal for it? Mainly writing. Okay. Okay, great. So I would say then two things. Mm -hmm. I think a short can be very helpful. And if you, if you need to make a short, and this is a real, cause it's never easy to make a short, okay? Mm -hmm. Like it's always like a very <laughs> frustrating situation even when you love it. Yeah. So if, you, if it's in your guts that you just need to get it out there, then make mm -hmm. the short. But if you're doing it because you wanna get on as a writer, well, making sure that you have a great pilot script is the most important thing to do. Okay. And once you have a great pilot script that seems to be working for people, you're having table reads of the pilot script, people are loving it, you're slipping it to a couple of people, people are really liking what they're saying, then you might wanna think of different options. Okay, so I have a script that people like, but in order to get it to the next level, you know, maybe I need to, maybe I, then I need to make a short or I need to make a web series version of it. Or, you know, I need to do what Lena Waith and I did back in the day. You know, she's got her show 20s on BET now. Mm -hmm. Back in the day when we were broke as hell and nobody was trying to buy our stuff, you know, what we did is we shot three scenes from it uh, with our friends and put that on YouTube. And that was able to get people to visualize it. And so she didn't, we didn't make a short, we didn't make something that could be entered into festivals or could, we just knew that like the script was already good. We wanted a visual component to help get that script sold because where Lena wanted to be at that time was to, to write and show run that, that kind of a show. Uh, somebody like Issa, who was sort of, you know, half writer, half actor, you know, what her main important thing was like, I just want to be in something week after week so that I can continue to refine my craft. So for her, it made more sense to put the energy and the efforts to doing a weekly web series than to say perfecting a perfect, you know, piece of writing. It just depends on where you want to go with it. Um, and the part of you that like gets excited when you're doing it, like mm -hmm. listen to that part, you know, like 
And if that part of you gets more excited writing or more excited visualizing, just, just pay attention to that and go with that. Because honestly, choosing the thing that you have the most endurance for is the most important thing. Yep. There, there isn't really a right or wrong way. It's just like, what can you put your more, the, the passion that you have into more consistently? Okay. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. We we have time for maybe two more questions, and then we're gonna we're gonna wrap up. I know that uh, Michaela Davis Curry has uh, she's kind of poking me over here to ask a question. Sure. I know uh, Tyler Hayes has a question he's itching to ask, and I know my guy Rodney Madison from Dillard University. He's he's itching to ask. So I'll I'll extend it to three. I'll extend okay. it to three. All right. So. Good. Uh, if we can be quick about it, we might be able to get a fourth, but three, certainly, if we can go ahead and, and work it through. Go, uh, Michaela, go first. Hello. So my question is, <laughs> you, uh, you would have table reads and y'all would have, a, a, y'all would sit in a writing room and y'all would collaborate or um, how did you build those relationships and how did you know to trust them with your idea? Because most of the time our ideas are like our babies and we don't know who we could tell about it because this is a very like competitive industry yeah um i'm i think you find I, and how did you find those people to collaborate with and bounce right back? um that's a really good question uh and i think in terms of like trusting people with your ideas it's a complicated answer because here's the thing your ideas are your babies my ideas are my babies but Odds are none of us have come up with something totally new because there's a limited amount of things. There's just a limited amount of ideas. I mean, you see it happen in movies all the time where like two movies come out the same year, they're about the same thing. Nobody copied each other. It's just like, you know, that's, what, that's what's in the zeitgeist. And so I, I see a lot of people afraid to share their work and afraid to build community around the work because they're afraid of someone stealing their idea. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, it absolutely happens. But I think that like the truth is, is that if you're if you're if you want to be a writer and you want to get things made, you want to get your craft to a level where nobody can execute at your level. It's more the ideas are important, but the execution is the most important. Two people can have you know I, there were plenty of other scripts about like young black people before dear white people, but none of them were executed in a, in the Justin Simeon kind of way. Nobody can like nobody and 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 by the way, now that the, now it's a real show, like I'm not I'm not trying to be shady or nothing but like people copy our show all of the time i mean they copy yeah. our show all the time they yeah. take our they take our writers they take our, our our dps they people do it all the time but nobody has replicated dear white people because it's mm. specific to the way i think and the way i execute so i would say you know you definitely want to be careful you don't want to overshare but you want to find people who you think can um hold you accountable and people who you know you can trust to show up really because that's really what it's about. It's just it's just having a group of people to hold you accountable. Um, doesn't matter if they're the best writers or you know or like you just it's not about that. It's like you know when the way I found it, I just I just talked to people at work, uh, people anybody who seemed like kind of interested in writing, I would open that door. It's like hey, would you ever want to I don't know get together and like do a writer's group or hold each other accountable? You know you can go online and Google the rules for a writer's group. Uh, there's plenty of examples of how other people put their things together. But the most important thing is to just sort of like get over a little bit of the fear that someone's going to take it because while that can happen, a lot of times that's really just the fear that someone's going to judge it and that someone is going to tell you it's bad. And look, we all make bad stuff. It's like part of it. It's like literally part of the process. You literally have to make something bad first. Like, have you seen people draw or like mold clay? It looks like crap at first. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> that's part of it. So kind of giving, getting yourself used to sharing things with other people to me is like a very, it's more important than guarding your work for yeah. me. Yeah. Uh, justice, Justice, go ahead. Justice. I'm coming, my fault. Sorry, can you see me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, damn, I'm chilling. Oh, sorry. Okay, so um, <laughs> my name is Justice Agumbor. Um, I'm a current senior at Prairie um, soon to be into the film world. So I have two quick questions, but they're like condensed. Okay. So my first question is, what do you think is harder, getting started or being able to keep going? Getting and, started. Okay, boom. <laughs> and then uh, my second question is, when do you when do you feel like an idea 
that you have for a series for a series or for film, whether whatever the case might be. Uh, when do you think? Um, oh, have you ever felt like better question? Have you ever felt like your idea for a project was expired and you left it alone, or do you feel like that's even that's not even possible? I think that's possible. I mean, mm-hmm. the truth is, is like here's the thing: is your art, you as an artist, that's your soul. Okay, mm-hmm. that's you got to do that for your life to feel yeah. good. But it's what, but the business is a marketplace, and mm-hmm. the marketplace isn't always looking for the things that my soul needs to create to be fulfilled. Right. And there are right. plenty of there are plenty of scripts that Justin Simeon has written that nobody knows about because the marketplace isn't looking for them, and so they're having to hold the beat until the marketplace opens up or, you know, my business opens up to where I can make something that risky or, you know, but I think the point is, is that like, there's a part where it's about your soul and getting the thing done. And that's separate from the part of you that has to think about getting the thing sold. Those are, those are separate parts of you. Those are separate parts of your business. Yeah. You have to do the first one always. You have to write what you love. You, all, you have to make something that you love. You have to find a way to stoke your passion. But, um, but sometimes it's not the time. And that doesn't mean it's bad or that you're bad. It just, the marketplace is tough, and especially for us. Um, it, it's unfair sometimes, but, but that's okay. That's okay. I think like not letting that defeat you and just selling yourself, it's a marketplace. There might be an opening for this later. Or, you know, nothing, no work you do will ever be in vain. It always makes the next thing you do better. Always. All right. I'm going to put in the conversation there. I just have to, uh, because I asked this man for 30 minutes and he has given us an hour. Um, I could take another one. I could take, I could take one more. I can take, more? I can take one more. Rodney, I, I see you, bad. brother. Rodney, yeah. I, see you. I can take a little Rodney. <laughs> yeah, Rodney What's is up, Rodney? like, I'm, I got to shoot my shot. Go ahead, um, Rodney. Okay, looking at the differences and understanding the differences between a film where you want a butt in a seat just for that film and looking at the difference in that for a television show where you want people to come back and watch every episode, what would you say are the challenges for that? Like making that difference? Um, I think the challenge is one of emphasis because with a movie, you're right. You're trying to get a butt in a seat. You're trying to give someone a singular experience. You're trying to give somebody an event that's so exciting that they're willing to give you an hour or two. With a show, you're trying to create a world that people want to stay in and become addicted to. And so the work is just a little different. With the movie, the emphasis is really on the on the, the story. You know, who are the characters, but where are they going and what do they want? And what is the ride that gets me there? For a show, it, it's really a lot more about like, who are the people? And do I want to stand in between them while they talk to each other? And what are they talking about? You know, I, I think like a lot of times like pilots that are really boring on the page is because it's all about the plot. It's all about the story, but the characters aren't particularly interesting. Whereas you watch something like the Cosby show and nothing would happen for 30 minutes, but it didn't matter because it was just really funny people talking to each other. So for a TV show, the emphasis is much more on the people, the personalities and their inner dynamics. And, and sort of like, you know, think about a group of people who, whether you like them or not, you could stand and listen to them talk to each other for an endless amount of time. That's who. You, that's that's the emphasis that you want to put uh, into your show. It's really it's the creating the world. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Man, man. That daggone Justin Simeon gave us some jewels today. I want to. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just say. I want to say two things, three things, and then we're gonna we're gonna bring it to an end. First of all, um, every single one of these students, whether they're our PV students. Um, whom you are very familiar with being from the Houston area uh, to our yes. neighbors over in New Orleans at Dillard University yes. and at Lawson State Community College over in Birmingham. What you are uh, doing for us today, Justice, Justice, Justin, I'm looking at <laughs> Justice because I want to say something about Justice. Uh, what you're doing for us today, Justin, is um, you're growing us. You're growing us. We're 10 feet taller because of this conversation today and we appreciate you. Um, This pandemic, you know, threatened to shut down a lot more than just um, the the jobs and the the work and the, you know, what we feel like is way of life. For a lot of our young people who are just starting out, it it also had a hand in shutting down some creativity. Yeah. These don't, you know, they're just starting out. 
So the flexibility and the adaptability to keep going and keep creating when all the tools have been taken away um, left some people feeling like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. And what you have done for us today has eclipsed what, what some receive in a whole semester. I'll say it. I'm, I'm, I'm a faculty member. I'm a professor who puts cameras in these young people's hands and teach them how to write and tell them about story arc and this and that. But there is something about hearing it from the likes of you and some of our other speakers that just make them grow. It excites them and it invigorates them. And in this time of this pandemic, um, it's, it, I'm hoping that they receive it as a gift that, um, you know, I can't even know more because I'm just so, I'm so thrilled for them about what you've given them today. Well, uh, it's, it's my pleasure. Um, the feeling is mutual. And, you know, it's like the time is always useful. Yeah. If you, you know, I remember a, a sermon is like, you know, if it's not time to reap, it's time to sow. And <laughs> if you can't make movies right now, you can always read a script and you can always watch stuff that you never would have thought to watch on your own. And that yeah. will always be valuable because you can also just read a book. Oh, you could also read a book. <laughs> <laughs> I bought this book. I found this book by accident right after I saw the film. Oh, nice. The first time. <laughs> because let me tell you about my reaction to the film the first time. I wasn't sure. Uh -huh. I was like, I'm, you know, I was in my 20s in the early 90s. And I remember <laughs> school days being that thing where I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, I recognize myself in that. Right. Uh -huh. And then I'm watching Dear White People and I was like, oh, you know what? This is, I think this is for them younger folk. I, I love this, but I, I'm trying to find where's it, you know, and then I gave it a second watch and then I found this. Now, mm -hmm. y'all, if you've not, if you've not seen this book, this is something that Justin wrote and um, there are these wonderful, wonderful, um, not only uh, instructions for, I don't know if y'all can see that, instructions for white people. <laughs> When is it a good idea, if ever, to wear blackface? Never, not never. And if you don't know, but then there are also these antidotes in here that black people could stand to read and um, and kind of, you know, address issues around colorism and issues around. Um, so when when I think about my third, probably my third watch of the film, um, I think okay there's a different language that these young people are using that um, is much more forward, much more um, very plain and simple and to the point, and it is what it is. It's not as um, subliminal. It is what it is. And then I said, oh, I see what's up. And then by the time the, the TV series came, um, I, I just became a huge fan of yours oh, and was not you. surprised at all that bad hair um, was equally entertaining as it was poignant. Great. Um, Thank you. you are you are winning, and you are teaching others how to win. And I just appreciate you beyond words. These young people have something to say in the world. And one of the things that um, we are doing in this series as a way to have the students stay in touch with all of our speakers is to invite our speakers to visit this page. So instead of doing oh, the Q&A, they're all pitching their various things and, uh -huh. you know, miss out some may miss out because there's not a whole lot of time for each person to say who they are and what they do. That's great. We have created and, and we're building it now. My webmaster, he's updating it today. As a matter of fact, um, each person has the ability to give you a single That's URL. Great. And you can then go to their YouTube channel or their LinkedIn. Um, Gerald May here is an aspiring writer. I think he has some writing samples in the world. Tyler, he has a couple, um, he has a short film and some and pieces that are linkable there. Jordan Dines, he's an aspiring cinematographer. Uh, Tatiana Battle, she's an aspiring um, news anchor as is Zanaria. And these young people um, are creating opportunities for you to find them and for them to be able to stay connected to you. So I'll, I'll send you and your assistant the email, I mean, the, the URL for that. And you can um, see what this group, what they're doing. Yes. And, um, and, and it'll be a way for everyone to stay connected. That's great. And, and one more little piece of advice I'm gonna say is read biographies, particularly of black artists, um, 
there's so many times in this industry where you're going to feel frustrated and you're going to feel alone. And when you realize that you're not and that you're one in a long lineage of people who have been pushing it just a little bit further, just a little bit further, it really helps to kind of put, put, put it all into some perspective. You know, um, so I, I just highly, even if it's not your particular art form, you know, read directors' biographies, read poets' biographies, read jazz musicians' biographies. Um, it's it's really, there's really, it, I always have to do that at some point when I'm just feeling like, God, this is a singular problem that only I am facing. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I say that about love songs. Like, you know, yeah. you know when, you, when you go through a breakup and you sit and listen to a Luther song or- You're like, oh, you know, that's what that means. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And look, and look, you sit there going, oh, somebody knows something about this because they wrote that song. Mm -hmm, or, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Partake in biographies, y'all. Do do the homework this man is giving you. Um, and and Justin, thank you again. I appreciate you. I know everyone here does. My and, pleasure. Um, yeah. Hey guys, you're gonna come back to us next week. We have some amazing people, not next week, on Thursday. Thursday, we have um, J.O. Malone, the founder of the National Black Film Festival. Um, at 1130, we have Vincent Powell, who's a filmmaker um, who directed the freshman year on our campus at Prairie View, recent um, grad from USC Cinematic School of the Arts. Um, we have uh, Patrick Walker, who is an actor. He was a featured actor on, on Power. Um, the Resident, which is on Fox Now and uh, Grey's Anatomy. Uh, we got so many people coming through and I just, I, I just say, can't say thank you enough to, to, to all of you for, for participating, not only here on the Zoom, but also on the live stream on YouTube. All right, we're going we gonna to sign out then. All right, y'all. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>